And here we go. The very top person, number one, with 4,855 points is Tessa. Tessa is not reading an essay, so she can just pick what she wants and then have a seat. The very next person, 4,805 points is Hope. Sylvia Pollard was born in 1931. Her family lived on a farm seven miles away from the nearest town, Williamsburg, Kentucky. They never had much, but the only things they ever bought from the store was salt and sugar. They had almost all they needed. Her father, who only did two years of college, taught at their one-room schoolhouse. In the beginning, Sylvia's home was composed of two rooms, but later her father, by himself, added two more, a kitchen and a dining room. It was very uncommon to see a large house. Their home had no running water or electricity, and their only source of warmth was an open fireplace. This made it so that Sylvia's family did not experience many of the hard times of the Depression because they had almost no bills to pay, and they ate what they grew. Sylvia remembers other people complaining about the ba how bad their situation was because of the Depression. Sylvia's family was composed of 14 members. Her mother, her father, seven sisters, the youngest of whom was not born until Sylvia was 18 in 1950, herself, and four brothers. All of the children in this family received a college education, and all but one of them went to Cumberland College, now known as the University of the Cumberlands, in Williamsburg, Kentucky. At the start of World War II, Sylvia's family had a radio, but no television, so they were not well informed about things going on in the war. Her father's only brother was called to serve, and Sylvia's father was outraged when he heard this, so he volunteered, but the military would not take him because he had, quote, too many children. She did have two or three uncles that served in World War I, other than her father's only brother. When Sylvia was 16, there was a small missions organization that came to Williamsburg to teach the Bible classes in the schools, but Sylvia's family did not go to church, and her parents would not let her go to these Bible classes. This mission also organized a vacation Bible school that Sylvia was allowed to attend, and it was at the CBS that Sylvia became a Christian and gave her life to the Lord. This mission also started a Sunday school, but Sylvia was not allowed to attend, so she and her sister drove their parents bonkers by doing Bible drills with each other. Her parents kept all of their kids quite close to home. Sylvia did not leave home until age 21 in 1953. She became a missionary to Kenya, where she found her husband, a fellow missionary, Herbert Pollard. Their first child, a girl, was born when Sylvia was 40 years old, and two more girls were close to follow. Sylvia's three girls were raised in Kenya and went to a Kenyan school, but were not completely lost when they came to America for the first time. Sylvia is now 91 years old and works at Source of Light Ministries International. She also has a garden that she tends daily. Six hundred and sixty-five points is Kate. In 1934, our neighbor, Mrs. Sylvia, was born in a little yellow house in Mississippi. The house that their family was living in was owned by the neighbor. Every day, Sylvia would go to the neighbor's filling station, and the kind neighbors would give her a big cookie and chocolate milk. When she was three, she moved three miles to near the mill where her father worked as a foreman. She doesn't remember what they ground there. World War II started when she was five. Her mother had two brothers and both went to war. They were able to meet up in Europe one time before the younger one was blown up in a, in a tank in France. They sent her aunt a purple heart in the mail. Almost everyone she knew had someone that had died. They had, they had a radio and letters were censored so that the vital information of the location of the troops and not be learned by the wrong side. Sylvia's mother, by looking at the newspapers that told where the, where the soldiers' battalions were, figured out where her brother's location was. She, t she sent a letter to him which said, My hunch is that you're in such and such a place. And then the brother sent a letter back which said, Your hunch is correct. One of her father's brothers was a, ch a chief, chef in the army. After the war, he worked in a hospital as the main cook. When he, when he retired, he got bored and wanted another job. He was a security guard for a small town apartment. He just loved talking to everyone, and everyone loved talking to him. One day, a Mexican tried to break into someone's apartment, and Sylvia's uncle caught him and brought him to the office. Everyone was so trusting in those days that her uncle put down his gun, his, uh, yeah. and the Mexican picked it up and shot him in the face. They never found the Mexican, and everyone stood around sad for days. Thank you. All right. Number four at 4,260 points. By the way, some of these differences were 10 points. Some of them, one of them was five points difference. This was a really close. 
4,260 points is Priscilla. Never give up. No path in life doesn't have a bump or unexpected curve. That doesn't mean you quit. Betty James had an awful husband who left her with six young kids, no money, and a nearly bankrupt company. He did leave one thing, though, a large metal spring. Nobody thought it to be anything much, but Betty did. She built a factory on only six acres of land and then went to work. She soon reinvigorated the brand with a series of ads that caught the attention of people. Eventually, Betty grew the company to a large and profitable enter enterprise and sold it to a firm for a huge amount of money. Moral of the story, never give up even though everything around you seems to crumble. Some of the greatest successes ever started out as terrible failures. Persevere. <laughs> Just a note for everybody watching this video, the interviews that are being told are true and they're about people who are still living that they interviewed personally. The essays also, of course, are about historical things. Number five, 4,250 points, just 10 points behind, was Claire. And number six at 4,055 is Bree. If I had lived during World War II, I would have gotten my friends to help me grow a community garden to help feed the neighborhood. We would grow lettuce, cabbage, carrots, turnips, cucumbers, green beans, tomatoes, corn, okra, which is very good for you, squash, and rows and rows of white potatoes and sweet potatoes. The leaves of the sweet potato plant are edible, and once you cook the leaves like you would with spinach and put a pinch of salt on top, you would have another healthy side to add to a simple meal. A section of my Victor community garden would be dedicated to flowers, which we would deliver in bouquets to women who had lost their husband or son. I would also raise chickens for meat and goats for milk. I would teach the neighborhood girls how to reuse clothes and things so that nothing goes to waste. For example, if a dress gets swept to the top or too small or stained, it can be cut up to make a skirt, and the top and sleeves can become dish racks. Brown paper bags can be cut up and folded into envelopes. The feed sets. Feed sacks can be sewn into cute dresses for young girls. Worn out rags can be braided together to make drugs. Corn husks can be made into dolls or toys, and so forth. This is how I'd help to end the war. Number seven, 3,455 points is Phoebe. James Stewart was an American actor and military pilot. With strong morality on and off screen, he was the perfect example of the American ideal in the mid-20th century. Born and raised in Indiana, Pennsylvania, Stewart started acting while at Princeton University. After graduating in 1932, he began a career as a stage actor appearing on Broadway and in summer stock productions. A licensed amateur pilot, Stewart enlisted in the Army Air Force soon after U.S. entered the Second World War in 1941. After action in Europe, he attained the rank of colonel and received several awards for his service. He retired in 1968, at which time he was awarded the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal. Acting in its wonderful life helped Stewart deal with his PTSD, because whenever the parts where George Bailey was breaking down in the movie, the film crew recognized that he wasn't acting. His PTSD was captured on film for potentially millions to see, one film crew member said. In 1949, he married former model Gloria McLean. They had twin daughters, and he adopted her two sons from her previous marriage. The marriage lasted until 1994 at when Gl Gloria died. Stewart died of pulmonary embolism three years later. Point number eight at 3,410 points, Rachel. Marina Sendler. Irina Semler was born on February 15, 1910 in Ockwalk, Poland. Her father was a medical doctor who died of typhus when she was a child. Also, her parents were part of the Polish Socialist Party. In 1931, Semler married Mikzislaw Semler. They moved to Warsaw before World War II started. She became a social worker overseeing the city's canteen that helped the people in need. When Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, she and her colleagues began to also use the canteens to help Jews with medicine, clothing, and other essential items. In 1940, the Nazis forced 400,000 Jews into a small, locked ghetto. Thousands died every month from disease and starvation. 
Because she was a social worker, Sandler could come and go from the ghetto regularly she, to help those who were trapped there. She soon joined Zagocha, the Council to Aid Jews. Sandler and 24 of her colleagues began to try to save as many Jewish children as they could. As they began to save orphan children, they had several ways of doing it. According to the website biography, they were carried out in caskets or potato sacks. Others would be taken in ambulances or stuck or snuck through underground tunnels. So others entered the Jewish side of the Catholic Church that straddled the boundary and left on the other side with new identities. Sandler would then help them to convents or non-Jewish families. As the ghetto's inhabitant situation became worse and worse, Sandler began to not only rescue orphans, but also children with parents. She could not guarantee their safety or their survival, but they would at least have a chance, she would tell the parents. She kept a detailed record and list of all the children she helped, buried in a jar. She planned to reunite the rescue children and their parents after the war. However, most parents did not survive. In the end, she and her group had rescued 2,500 children. Sumner personally had rescued about 400 out of that group. She was arrested on October 20th, 1943. They sentenced her to the Powart Prison, according to the website biography. They sent her to the Powart Prison. They tortured her to try to get her to reveal the names of her associates. She refused and was sentenced to death. However, Zagota members bribed the prison guards and she was released in February 1944. Irina Sendler died May 12, 2008, in Warsaw, Poland, at the age of 98. Oh, thank you. Number nine, 3,250 points is Audrey. Bad Eyes, a story about my great Aunt Hazel's mother, as told by Aunt Hazel. My grandmother, who I never knew, my mother's mother, and my grandpa had a boarding house, and they would rent rooms out, and there was this real weird-looking man they had rented a room to. My mother at the time was not married, but she had a boyfriend, which turned out to be my father. She and my Aunt Gladys, her sister, were playing cards with her boyfriend, but they didn't know that Bad Eyes, the real weird-looking man, was at the bottom of the stairs. The reason they called him Bad Eyes was because he always had bloodshot, terrible-looking eyes. When they were playing cards around the dining room table, they would say, Well, I'm going to tell you what's in my hand. This is Homer, that was my daddy's name, and this is Gladys, and this is Bad Eyes. And they would just laugh and laugh about Bad Eyes. But they didn't know that Bad Eyes was not in his room. He was at the bottom of the steps, taking all this in. Then everyone went their way, and Gladys went to her room, and the boys left. And my mother was straightening up after the card playing, and Bad Eyes was at the foot of the stairs sharpening his knife. My mother started to go down the stairs, but Bad Eyes jumped up and started to attack her. She started out the back door. She was sprinting away from him as fast as she could. Bad Eyes passed a woodpile where there was an axe, so he picked up the axe. And my mother used to tell this, and it would make my blood run cold. He was swishing the axe in the air and trying to cut her head. She could feel the breeze from the axe only inches away from her head as she ran. She ran to a place where some loggers were camping. The loggers then grabbed Bad Eyes, so anyway, it turned out he was an escapee from an insane asylum. So they captured him and put him right back where he belonged. Wow. <laughs> okay. At only five points behind, number 10, Jamie. The bravery and true historic her heroic story of Desmond Doss struck the theaters in 2016 in the dramatic film Hacksaw Ridge. This movie shows the daring story of Desmond Doss, the only man on the front lines of World War II who did not carry a weapon. Doss was a Seventh-day Adventist who did not believe in violence. He firmly believed in the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill. He took this commandment very seriously, so much that he wouldn't even touch a firearm. The touching and legendary story of Desmond Doss indeed shows the bravery of men who fought in American fought for America in World War II. Doss grew up in a small Virginia town and displayed empathy for others from a young age, such as the time he walked six miles to donate blood to an accident victim. He hated weapons from his childhood. According to him, the last time he held a weapon was when his mother asked him to hide his father's forty five caliber revolver. His mother his mother feared that his father might kill his uncle, as he hardly had control of his anger. Doss's mother had the most significant impact on his life by raising him as a Seventh-day Adventist. A Seventh-day Adventist believes in the second coming of Christ and, and has their Sabbath on a Saturday rather than Sunday. 
Thus, also refrain from eating meats. This was common as Seventh Day Adventists. On April 1st, 1942, Dawson enlisted for the Army. And little did he know the struggles he would face. Dawson enlisted as a combat medic and was told he didn't need a weapon to serve his country in the medical field. So he enlisted as a conscientious objector, although Doss would rather call himself a conscientious cooperator. He was sent to train at Fort Jackson in South Carolina with the 77th Infantry Division. The soldiers in his unit bullied and insulted him for his beliefs. The commanders wanted him discharged. The superiors wanted him gone so bad they assigned him to a rifling company. Through all this pain and disrespect, Doss was stubborn and always kept as stubborn as always, and kept perse per persevering. Doss served in many battles overseas, but the most acknowledgeable was the Battle of Okinawa. This battle occurred at the Media es Escarpment, also known as Hacksaw Ridge, located on top of a 40 400 vertical cliff. Once the American soldiers climbed up the rope trailing to Hacksaw Ridge, the Japanese counterattacked the Americans, and American men were many American men were lost that day. The Battle of Okinawa was the final battle of World War II, but the deadliest. Doss earned his respect on that ridge. He saved countless men, dodging bullets as if they weren't even there. He was putting others' life before his. He would run out, out of cover to save a man calling for help. No matter how wounded the soldier was, Doss would try his hardest to save that man. After the commanding officers ordered a retreat, Doss stayed on the ridge for 12 hours. After the retreat, lowering, lowering injured men down, the rope, down by a rope off the cliff. While, the cliff, while on the cliff by himself, Doss was slowly running out of energy from carrying many men yards to lowering them down the cliff. He asked the Lord, one more, help me get one more, every time he lowered a man. Doss did not leave a single living soldier up on that ridge. That day, Desmond Doss lowered 75 men to the bottom of the cliff, saving their lives. After spending 12 hours rescuing men by himself, Doss did not acquire any life-threatening wounds. The story of Desmond Doss is extremely inspiring and legendary. I love learning more about this heroic figure who risked his life for others. He stayed in war, a war full of death, and refused to take another man's life, even if they were the enemy. He survived one of the deadliest battles of World War II history, and on top of that, saved 75 men while alone, unarmed, with Japs lurking, lurking around. This fearless man has shown me not to conform to this world and remember that God's always right. Very good. Making sure we're still recording. All right. Next one at 2,940 points is Joshua. So what I did um, for my poster board, I did toys from the 1900s and I'm sorry, 1950s. Um, so I to start out, I'll tell you guys about Meccano. Um, Meccano um, was... Created in 1898 by Frank Hornby in Liverpool, England, the system consisted of visible metal strips, plates, angle guards, garters, wheels, axles, and gears, and plastic parts that are connected connected using nuts and bolts. Yeah, that's no, I can't know. Okay, I'll tell you guys about Lincoln Logs now. Lincoln Logs were first created in 1960 by Frank Lord Wright and were popularized. In 1924, just as parents were discovering the value of construction toys, Wright used the story past of Abraham Lincoln's childhood cabin as inspiration. Uh, yeah, that's the Lincoln notes. And the, te the teddy bear. Morris Mickton, a Brooklyn candy shop owner, saw a cartoon and had an idea. He and his wife, Rose, made stuffed animals, and Mickton decided to make a toy there and dedicate it to Teddy Roosevelt because he refused to shoot a bear on a hunting trip. He named the stuffed animal Teddy's Bear. Yeah, I make them, and now I'll tell you about the Mickey Mouse doll. When the popularity of the Mickey Mouse doll began to soar in the early 1930s, Walt and Roy were Confronted with making a Mickey Mouse doll. It's Slinky. Oh, okay. Mechanical in 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 yeah. engineer Richard James invented the Slinky by accident in 1943. 
He was working to de devise screens that could keep sen sensitive shipments steady at sea. After accidentally knocking some s s um, sam samples off a shelf, he watched in amazement as the slinky walked down. The hula hoop. In 1957, Wanlo Toy Company founders Richard Neer and Arthur Spud Mellon learned that kids in Austria whirled bamboo strips around their waist in gym, gym class. Within a year, Wanlo had created hula hoops out of Philips Petronomlin. <laughs> <Nearly, laughs> yeah. Nearly newly developed plastic mar marlets. All right, next to two at thousand six hundred and thirty five points is Luke. We're going to be reading a story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born in Germany. He lived when Hitler was killing Jews. He decided to kill Hitler. One of his plots was to plant a bomb in Hitler's plane. However, this plot didn't work because the fuse went out of the bomb. Another plot was to bomb Hitler's train, but the plot also didn't work. Hitler barely escaped death. A lot of churches did not stand up to Hitler. The Bible says, you shall not kill. But what other way was there to win the war against evil Hitler? Bonhoeffer was in the secret service for Hitler so he was not sent to the front lines. The Germans involved in the plot had one last gamble. It was time to make sure this plot didn't go on. The Japanese had just bombed Pearl Harbor in, at 1755 AM with 79 fighters and 171 bombers. Without declaring war on the US, the Americans had to join the war. Von Hoffa feared the war would never end. The Japanese and the Germans were attacking so many countries Bonhoeffer feared many people would continue to be killed. Bonhoeffer and his secret rebels hit a bomb in Hitler's house. The house exploded, but Hitler survived the plot, and there was not going to be another plot. Even though Bonhoeffer was caught, he helped many Jews escape into safe places. Bonhoeffer said not to speak out is doing evil. If Germans didn't stand up against Hitler, they would be sent to the front lines anyways to a certain death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was caught and sent to prison. He obtained some writing supplies from the guards and started a journal of himself. He became, because he knew he would soon be killed, Bonhoeffer was executed. So enough, the Battle of D-Day came and the Allies began taking back captured land from the Germans. Hitler was defeated. Dietrich did not live to see Hitler be defeated, but he received his wish. Hitler is no more. The war has ended. With 2,310 points, David. I interviewed my great aunt Hazel Collins. She was born in 1932 to Lena and Hamo Townsend. Hazel was the youngest of six girls and the only living daughter of Lena and Hamo. Her sister was in Order of age. Violet, my great grandmother, Mo, Grace, Alina, Claire, Nell, Nell, and Hazel. Hazel grew up on a farm. She does, doesn't remember very much of the Great Depression because she was a little girl. She does remember candy being va very valuable. They would only have a candy bar on a very special occasion and her mother would break it into many small pieces so they would each have a piece. Girls and ladies always wore dresses when she was growing up and never wore pants. When Hazel had free time, she liked to climb trees. Aunt Hazel has always enjoyed telling us funny stories of her mother's life and her life. When she was little, Hazel did not get to see her father often because how he was in the army and had to leave a lot. Next with 2,290 points, 
Rebecca. Maybe she can read hers next week if she'd like. With 1,870 points, Jordan. You can just explain it while it's up on the, there you go. So the 2x2 two two was written in 1975 by um, Larry and Nicholas. So 3x3 three three was written in 1975 by Larry and Nicholas. And 4x4 was written in 1975 by Peter Dexter. So 5x5 was invented in 1975. So 6x6 was invented by Peter Dexter. That dude. <laughs> <laughs> the pyramids was invented by William Markham. And then the. Uh, Which one's your favorite? Yeah? All right. Good. Or I was born. Okay. Next up with the poster and tally. Talking about oh, thanks. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about how music changed and music through the 20th century. So the music from the 1920s and earlier than that were they had a lot of ragtime music, um, you know, like the da -da 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 music and the and also jazz music. Um, the record player actually was kind of popularized at this time like the one that actually played the discs. Um, and then the music from the 1930s and 40s was more jazz and then also barbershop quartets. Um, the music from the 50s was uh, a lot of, like, rock and roll became a fad. So Elvis and Buddy Holly and the Everly Brothers kind of popularized rock and roll, and then, like, also blues was popular. Um, the music from the 60s. Uh, the 60s were interesting because the music from the 60s kind of changed. Um, there was a lot of angst in the 60s, so they kind of um, had a lot of music about, like, oh, we need peace instead of fighting. And the 70s had a lot of, actually, disco music. Um, and, yeah, that's the 70s. Um, the music from the 80s was really synthy. And there's also a lot of cheesy romantic ballads made. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Um, but yeah. Um, but there were also a lot of glam metal. Um, interesting music. And then the 90s. Uh, one thing that was popular in the 90s was like heavy, slow, dark music. And then there was also boy bands. And rock music was actu actually popularized in the 90s. Um, it was popular in the 80s too, but it kind of became quite popular. And I don't know if I have time to read this. Do I? Which one? Okay. The invention of the electric guitar. The electric guitar was originally created for jazz guitar players who wanted the guitar to be heard even in big band settings. These early electric guitars were hollow acoustic guitars with electromagnetic trans stuff. The first electric stringed instrument to be sold was invented by George Buchamp and Adolf Rickenbacher in 1930. By the time it was patented, others had already started making their own versions of the electric guitar. Some of the early manufacturers of the electric guitar include Rickenbacker, Dobro, National, Vega, Epiphone, and Gibson. The first functional solid body guitar was designed and built by Les Paul in 1940. Which a solid body guitar basically means a guitar that's not empty in the middle, so it has a better tone. Um, it was made from solid, a solid piece of wood with two halves of a hollow body glued on the sides just for um, decoration. The solid body guitar soon brought a new, cleaner sound to music and is still used today. Yeah. Next one up with no essay or poster is Daniel Spivey. 14,880 points to Meadow, 
with 1160 points. Good job. Next is Anna Rose. She's going to tell us about her poster. We'll bring the video over there. You can just go stand next to it and tell us about it. Okay, so this is like the first year and how they were like, I'm going to tell like how it changed the dresses. So they were like wearing hats and they were like expensive dresses that like goes for the, the second generation. Then this was like kind of getting more out of jobs. Until they started, I guess, around the second started to work there too. Mm -hmm. And then these were just like normal things, and it just got cheaper down. And then they had like decorations, but then it got more straight down, not as much stuff this year through the generation. Mm -hmm. And you see the other two set Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next up is Lily. What is supposed to be, Lily? Really? Really you can explain yours. Yeah, if you aren't getting sick, all of you people who are watching. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Lily. Hey, Lily. America's fashion sense has changed drastically over the last century. It all started in the 1900s with the escorset and piled hair, then to the tens with the ridiculously overdecorated hats and straighter dresses. The 20s were a very important fashion decade. The flapper look dominates this era. The 30s. the 30s had a very simple fashion due to the Depression, but the waists were more fitted and it was made of cheaper materials. The 40s were the recovery, and a lot of women wore shoulder pads and A-line skirts that came waist high. Even the men's pants were high waisted. 50s girls wore poodle skirts, ponytails, which are high, and then the greasers. These dudes, they wore leather jackets and rolled up jeans with pompadours. <laughs> And then the 60s with the hippies culture dominating the fashion. It's weird. With bright colors and like intricate patterns, flowers, jeans. 70s. Saturday Night Fever had a huge effect on fashion in the 70s. Feathered hair and bell bottom jeans were very stylish with men and women. 80s. The dudes rocked the whole double denim look and had really sick mullets. And the ladies wore body suits and shoulder pads and really big hair. And in the 90s, preppy dudes had the curtain hair and the windbreakers, while the dudettes, they wore plaid mini skirts and had thin headbands. And then the grunge dudes wore wide leg jeans and skater shoes. Yeah, the girls had the uh, overalls with the one class one done down the back. And then um, flannels tied around the waist. Next several are woo, points without essays. So I'm going to list them off and you can just go pick your prize. We've got Violet Nelson. Good job. Chloe. Violet. Lindsay. Ryan. Did I wait so you don't fight over stuff? <laughs> Okay, we'll pause there for a minute while Naomi is going to come. Naomi was not technically in our class, but she contributed so much that she would have got 1,450 points from all the things that she did. Naomi's going to come and read an essay that she did, an interview of someone posting one. Dear World War II Heroes, both of my great-grandfathers fought heroically in World War II. Both seldom spoke of the war, but each paid the price in battle. Louis Strickland fought bravely and was seriously hurt and one of the few survivors of his group. He was forced to spend three days in a foxhole with four dead German soldiers before being rescued. He was awarded the Purple Heart for bravery on the battlefield. 
Jack and Mo was one of six sons of a widow who all were sent to the war. All at the same time, my great great grandfather Jack and his brothers fought in the heroic battle of the bulge. Um, amazingly, that their mother was a praying woman, and and every one of them returned to her alive. Jack was injured by a trample in battle, which, which stayed in his life for the rest of his life. I am very grateful for the sacrifices of both my great-grandfathers and the other American soldiers who sacrificed themselves for the liberties and freedoms we have today. Well done. All right, finishing up with Levi, Moses, and Jack. All right. So I said this was pretty short. I hope you all got things that you wanted. With the rest of our time, we're going to take a few pictures. I'm going to give a few announcements, etc., and we might get you out a little bit early today since it's almost Christmas break. So that's the end for here. Hope you enjoy.